the werewolf in suburbia. Anna winced as the removal men bashed her eight-ring gas range into the front door frame of her new house. They also threw her boxes of rare Northern Soul vinyl onto the wooden floor without a care in the world. A little bit of rage ignited inside of her, and she had to put a cardigan on to hide the stiff gray hairs which were standing up on her arms. Anger was a no-no for her. The angrier she grew, the more the change exerted itself over her body. She had to be in control. She left them to it, deciding it was better not to see what they were doing. In her new conservatory she took off her shoes and breathed deeply, looking out at the garden with its autumnal carpet of orange and yellow leaves. Apples lay on the lawn under the apple tree. She tried to skim over the sight of the electrically charged barbs which ran along the top of the wooden fence and completely cut off the garden. She had to try and contain herself. Her girlfriend, Lindy, was coming over later to cook a vegan meal. Anna was trying so hard to love vegetables. No flesh, human or otherwise, had passed her lips for over four months now. When she thought of flesh, she rang her Tibetan singing bowl and chanted Oem. She was trying to be good. Anna really liked Lindy. She was the reason for the move, probably. Anna needed to calm down. Living in the heart of London, roaming the streets at night, taking homeless strangers or workers returning home after a night shift. The temptation was too strong. Lindy was teaching her control. Later on, after the removal men had finished destroying her stuff, Anna and Lindy cuddled up on the sofa together. Lindy stroked Anna's arm hair. She said it was sexy. The doorbell rang just as Bake Off was coming on the telly. Anna sighed and went to answer it. Hi. Welcome to the neighborhood. The woman was in her fifties, wearing a gigantic gray, felted, poncho and smelling overpoweringly of Bayless and Harding products. Hi, Anna hadn't really been expecting visitors. She would have preferred to go unnoticed. I made some flapjacks for you. The woman thrust a plate of muesli blobs, liberally sprinkled with berries and dried apple. Oh God, more pet food. Anna took them reluctantly. Well, the woman sang obliviously. Can I look around the old place? I haven't been in here since Babs left two years ago. She giggled and pushed past Anna and into the hallway. Oh, I like this wallpaper although I would have gone for something more burn number myself. More earthy. She poked around into every room downstairs, finishing up in the sitting room where Lindy was still watching TV. Oh, hello, dear. Are you Anna's sister? The woman seemed to have no concept of privacy. No. I'm Anna's girlfriend, Lindy. Nice to meet you. Lindy leaned over the back of the sofa and extended a hand to the woman, who wrinkled up her nose and shook Lindy by the fingertips. Oh, how modern! The woman gave Anna a last glance down her nose. Well, I hope you settle in well, she sniffed, backing away to the door. They heard the front door slam as she practically ran out of the house. That's one way to get rid of nosy neighbors. Anna laughed and handed Lindy the plate of flapjacks, sure that she would appreciate them. She felt the hairs on her arms. It had been a very irritating day. Hairs were starting to rise on her back as well. Lindy, I think you had better go now, honey. I'm feeling a little jangled. Oh, Lindy looked disappointed. I thought you were hungry. I thought you were going to eat me alive tonight. No. I don't really think you would like that right now. Okay, Lindy was used to Anna wanting her own space. She kissed her and said she'd ring tomorrow. Anna went to the kitchen and threw the rest of the aubergine tajin in the bin. She was hungry. Really hungry. Over the next three days Anna had no less than six visitors. All neighbors wanting to check out the weird, hairy lesbian who had come to live in their street. Word travels fast in a small town. Kelly, from number seven, said that Anna should come over for dips and wine on Sunday. 
Did Anna know about the Friday spinning class at the gym? A real great workout, so good for those stubborn love handles. Stephen, number nine, called over to tell her, in a most unneighborly fashion, not to park in the street during the day. Ted, number 16, said she could come over and look at his vinyl collection. But not on a Tuesday because that's when his mum came over to clean every week. By the end of all the visitors, Anna was left sitting on a chair in the kitchen cradling her pounding head. She felt her heckles raising and rippling, getting ready to transform at any moment. She hadn't eaten for days, not even a tomato, and she felt she was losing it. She went to the porch and looked out of the window. It was getting dark. Orange and flame red leaves blew down the street, past other porches bedecked with skeletons and jack-o'-lanterns grinning inanely at passers-by. It was Halloween. She hadn't even noticed. She started to pace up and down the hallway, using all her calming techniques and deep breathing. It was no good. She doubled over at the bottom of the stairs and felt her clothes starting to rip as the change took her. She was shaking when the doorbell rang. Trick or treat, she heard the kids shout outside. All was quiet for a second, then another ring. Quiet again. Then she heard them discussing what to do about the lack of sweets. Stupid dyke. Let's give her some of this. A stink bomb was pushed through the letterbox and the smell of sulfur wafted into the hall as the children ran laughing and shrieking down the street. Anna pushed herself up to standing and found herself looking in the hallway mirror at her reflection. Her yellow teeth were dripping with saliva and her dog ears were pinned back against her head, alert and tense. She reached for the mirror, snarling, and smashed it onto the floor. Her reflection become one hundred werewolves, all starving and ready to tear into human flesh. She ran around the house, pulling crockery off the shelves and upturning the sofa. The, the doorbell rang again. This time she flew at it and wrenched it open so hard it was left hanging from its hinges. Limby saw the creature and started to run. But Anna was too quick and her clawed fingers reached out and grabbed Lindy's shirt, dragging her back into the house. She threw her girlfriend down on the floor. I don't want to kill you. I want you to be with me and we will never die. Together. Unfortunately it came out not as words but the guttural whining of a rabid dog. Lindy was screaming and trying to fight her way free. Anna tore the girl's shirt open and mauled her chest and neck. An approaching noise stopped her. Outside there were more kids coming up the path to her house. When they saw her pawing towards them, they laughed, thinking it was a wild costume. But they scattered as she started to run towards them on all fours, the hair on the back of her neck standing straight up and foam flying from the corners of her mouth. She stopped abruptly outside number nine. She could smell Stephen, the self-appointed parking attendant. The light was on in the sitting room. She made her way up the driveway, batting pumpkins out of the way, and ran full speed at the front door, smashing it open with sheer brute force. She sniffed her way to the sitting room. Steve and then his wife were on the sofa. He turned and saw Anna, only having time for a pathetic yelp before she bore down on him, ripping into his throat with her razor-sharp incisors. She held on to his throat with her powerful jaws until he stopped moving. Stephen's wife was screaming, trying to pull Anna away. Anna grabbed her arm and pulled it clean out of its socket. The flesh tore and blood soaked the cream shag pile. The wounded woman ran from the house to the street, pouring blood onto the concrete until she collapsed outside number 12. Meanwhile, Anna was still bent over the body of her first kill in four months. She savored every sinew and strip of glistening flesh she ripped off, nuzzling the body like an animal on a David Attenborough documentary. When she was satisfied, she stalked out of the house and ran up the street to the deserted common beyond. The moonlight shone down on her gray fur, and she felt the night air, cool and fresh on her muscle, as if she was feeling it for the first time. In the light of the moon she threw her head back and let out a blood-curdling howl. 
suddenly her ears pricked back. In the close distance another returned a mournful wail. She grinned at the moon and made her back to the suburbs to sniff out her new blood sister. The End Halloween date. I already regret this. I can't believe I've let you convince me to do that. What? Spend Halloween night at the cemetery? Would you rather spend the night knocking on strangers doors and picking up candies? We are too old for that. Wow, how old do you think you are? We are only 16 years old. And I like candies. Candies are for little children, Nat. We can't do little kid things anymore. We need to do something more appropriate for our age. And what is appropriate about spending the night in the cemetery, Ryan? Are you afraid of the dead, Natalie? You're too old to believe in such nonsense. It's not it. I just don't understand what's so interesting about a cemetery. And there must be a lot of disgusting insects there. Oh, okay. I see it now. You are afraid of insects. Don't worry about them. You are with me and I will protect you from the evil insects, rest assured. I won't let them come near you. Ryan finished speaking with a smirk and winked at Natalie. She realized he was making fun of her and decided to end the conversation. It wasn't the first time that Ryan had these crazy ideas. But for some reason, Natalie always accepted his ideas and they were never as fun as he promised they would be. Like that time, on July 4th, when Ryan thought it would be much better to see the fireworks on top of the mountain that is in the park where they set off the fireworks. They started to climb when there was still sunlight. They reached the top of the mountain, had a picnic, and waited for the fireworks. Natalie didn't like going up the mountain many insects, stones, and spiders. She got up there all sweaty and with messy hair. However, the picnic was very tasty and the view was really beautiful. The fireworks started and honestly, Ryan was right, it was a privileged sight. The show ended and darkness enveloped them. Ryan had taken flashlights, but they couldn't find their way back. They had to be rescued by rangers. Natalie knew that her boyfriend had good intentions and the beginning of the adventure is always fun. Ryan just fails to plan his way home. They arrive at the cemetery, which is closed. Ryan helps Natalie to jump over the wall and jumps right after her. The sky is starry. The full moon shines in the sky. They don't even need flashlights to see the way. Finally, they reach the center of the cemetery where there is a small bandstand composed of a roof supported by wooden columns. There are no insects in sight. Ryan and Natalie put their backpacks on the floor and start arranging dinner. Natalie made some sandwiches and Ryan took the drinks, apple cider with cinnamon and caramel. The hot cider helps to ward off the cold and brings some comfort. To make it more romantic, Ryan takes two long thin candles out of his backpack and lights them. Natalie still thinks everything is beautiful and secretly wonders when things are going to start going wrong. Ryan must have noticed something in her features, as he asked. Is there a problem, Nat? None, everything is beautiful. You were right. Before Natalie finished her sentence she saw a small cloud of flying insects gathering around the candlelight. Natalie begins to regret coming to a cemetery. Ryan, it's getting late and I'm cold. Shall we eat and go? But the night is just beginning, we still have a lot to do here. Like what, Ryan? What do we still have to do in the middle of this cemetery? Make out. Ryan came closer to Natalie and put his arm around her while she watched, out of the corner of her eye a spider approaching the candles and the flies dancing around the light. Natalie froze, all her senses attentive to the spider's slow, precise movements, 
getting closer and closer. Ryan didn't notice the spider's approach, he was more concerned with Natalie's body. He had his right arm around Natalie's shoulders and his left hand came close to her left leg. When the soft touch finally happened, Natalie jumped up and shouted, Oh my god, there's a huge spider coming up on me! And she jumped and hit and screamed. Ryan thought Natalie was dirty and also shouted, There is no spider. I put my hand on your leg. This is not funny at all, Natalie. Yes, there is a spider. I saw her near the candles. She wants to eat flies. Blow those out, please. Ryan blew out the candles and the bandstand went dark. The moon was now covered with large clouds and there was little light. In the dark, Natalie had another start when Ryan took her hand. She couldn't see where the spider had gone and that worried her. Ryan, I want to go now. But Nat, we're just getting started. We are alone and we have the whole night to ourselves. Let's enjoy it a little. Enjoy what? You have nothing to enjoy here, Ryan. Only tombs, insects, darkness, and cold. The clouds covering the moon worry me. It could also rain. There are no insects here and if it rains, we are sheltered. You are very tense. You need to relax a little. I will only relax when I am at home, warm and safe in my bed. Natalie grabbed her backpack and flashlight and started walking towards the cemetery wall with the flashlight in her hand. The light attracted more flies and even a beetle. She was waving her hands away. Soon bats appeared hunting for insects. One of them flew very fast through the flashlight. Natalie got scared and knocked over the flashlight, which was left lit on the floor, and started running in the dark. Startled and disoriented, Natalie ran through the graves and tombstones of the cemetery until she passed through a huge spider web. The web covered his face and hair, and the feeling was horrible. The worst was to imagine hundreds of spiders covering her body. Natalie tried to get the web out of her face as she ran through the cemetery, and screamed at the top of her lungs. Meanwhile, Ryan was at the bandstand, upset that he failed again. He just wanted to be alone with Natalie and have a romantic evening. He no longer knew what to do when he heard a shout. He turned quickly and saw the lantern, lit on the floor. He started looking for the source of the screams that moved through the cemetery. He started running after the screams and they got closer and closer. He ran even faster to reach the screams. Then something hit him and knocked him over. He was hit by Natalie. They were both on the floor, sore and tired. Natalie was still struggling with spiders. Ryan turned on his flashlight and helped Natalie. There were no spiders, just strands of the web in his hair. Natalie, there's no spider, just web. Let me help you, please. Natalie heard her boyfriend's soft voice and sat down. There is no spider? No, I just see the web, that's all. Ryan approached Natalie and started removing the last strands of the web that were still in her hair. That's it. Now there is no more web. Come on, let's go. They got up, walked over to the gazebo, put everything in their backpacks, and left. Walking hand in hand under the moonlight. The end.